Welcome to the Home Bar Beginner with me, Vic Vinegar, and today we're going to be going through a drink tutorial of one of the most classic cocktails out there. Arguably next to the, the Martini, which is typically crowned the king of cocktails, this has got to be up there. It's one of the most popular and one of the oldest, and that is the Old Fashioned. It's also kind of alarmingly simple for how good it tastes and how popular it is. So this is a drink people can be kind of picky about, so there are different rules of thumb with how many ounces of bourbon to use, how many dashes of Angostura bitters to use. Some people even substitute in other bitters. The biggest subject of debate is whether to use a sugar cube or simple syrup. So just to get that out of the way, today I'm going to be using simple syrup and arguably a little bit of a heavy pour. Some people like just a little bit of sugar. They really want it to be bourbon with bitters. Personally, I like it a little sweeter. That's probably just heavy on your palate, but I have made it this way for some bourbon enthusiasts and they have enjoyed it thus far. So to get started, what we're gonna be starting with is the main ingredient. And I mean the main ingredient is gonna be your bourbon. So traditionally you use bourbon with it. You could also use a rye. I also set these out here. This is an apple brandy or apple jack. Brandy works perfectly well with it. I made it with the brandy, it works pretty well. A Canadian whiskey works fine. An Irish whiskey would probably do. Scotch might be pushing the line a little bit. Um, and really depending on really depending on your personal preference. It is intended to be a relatively sweet drink, especially for one of these classic cocktails. A lot of them are very dry, very alcohol focused. This is alcohol focused, but it is on the sweeter end. So the bourbon works really well for that. You could use something like a hundred proof of 50% vodka or not vodka whiskey as well. Today I'm using a 90 proof, so it's 45% alcohol by volume. That's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty good middle ground. It also goes down to 80 proof. That would work as well. You're just not going to get as much bang for your buck. So probably just generally speaking, the stronger it is, you could probably dial it down. So something like an 80 proof, which is on the weekend, I would use probably two and a half ounces of bourbon. With this 90 proof, I'm gonna be using two ounces, and with the 50%, you could probably even dial it back from there. Depends what your taste buds like, and guess what your tolerance is. So then I'm also using simple syrup. So this is homemade simple syrup, hence why it has no name brand on it, it's just my own personal label to let me know when I made it. It's one-to-one -one simple syrup, so it's literally just white sugar, granulated sugar that's dissolved into hot water and then cooled down. So equal by volume, one-to-one. -one. The Angostura bitters I've also got out here. Bitters, I'm going to be doing a video on all to their own as to what these are, so I won't get into it too much, but one way or the other, bitters really work like your salt and pepper to cocktails and bartending as salt and pepper do to cooking. So you don't use very much of them. They're actually incredibly alcoholic, 44% by volume. So about the same, but it's they're pretty intense and they're very intense in flavor, so you don't use much of them. And the final ingredient today is gonna be orange. So the old fashioned calls for orange zest or an orange peel. They also do them sometimes with candied orange peels. So, but today it's just gonna be a swath of orange. I'll show you how I'm gonna cut that. So for the mixing class, that fell into a video that I either have already posted or will post, depending on when you're seeing this on my advanced bar tools. So the tools of refinement, we talked about in a previous video, my bar tools one with the basic bar tools that these really aren't all that necessary. They really just make you look more fancy. That That is really 80% of it. They also have vertical sides, so it makes it easier to spin your spoon around. But I won't belabor that too much either. You'll see that in another video. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to add ice into the mixing glass or whatever you have available. Now another caveat I want to throw out here is that traditionally you would use blocks of ice. So a lot of times I would use clear blocks. I don't have those readily available today so I'm using packaged ice that I got from a gas station or shopping mart. So traditionally you would use blocked ice for both mixing the drink and serving the drink as well. Traditionally, old fashioned comes with one big block of ice, like a big cube, I mean, that big round or so. Or if they're real fancy, sometimes bars will serve them with spherical ice cubes, so an ice sphere. That's pretty neat too. Anyway, you want a lot of ice and a little and a bit of liquid. But anyway, for today's sake, 
Here's my block of ice. Get it all cubed together. I'm actually gonna break this up a little bit. Just gonna use the back of my muddler. And sling ice everywhere. I'm gonna set that right up front. One more chunk for good measure. All right, so I've got the ice in there. Now the glass is chilling down. I don't recommend chilling a mixing glass like this if you have it, just because if it's wet, it might be prone to cracking. If you put it in the fridge, it's probably fine, but don't recommend the freezer. So usually you want to start with your cheapest ingredients first. Just a rule of thumb. So I'm going to start with my simple syrup, because like I said, that's just sugar and water. It's really just like hummingbird food, if you've ever made that to put in your backyard. Basically same concept, just for people. So with this, I'm gonna be doing one ounce of simple syrup. So I've got my Japanese jigger. So I'm gonna be filling this one to the brim and leaking a little as I go. So if you caught that video on basic bar tools, you heard me say that they're a lot easier to tip while they're sitting here, like I just did, but then a lot more stable when it comes to transferring. So that was all a ploy to show you what I was talking about in another video. Okay, so next up, and really the only other major ingredient is our bourbon. So the bourbon, like I said, it's a 90 proof. This is Ezra Brooks. This is the one liter. It's actually a really good bourbon for the price. So I got this one for, I think, $17.99, which if you're just getting into this and you say, oh, geez, that's more than I want to spend, buy something even cheaper. Absolutely. This is just a highly recommended Highly recommended bourbon. I think on Distiller, it's a popular website for everything distilled. It gets like 88 points by the experts, which is pretty good. To crack 90 points for anything under like 35 bucks is pretty unheard of. So for an $18 bottle, this is really comp competing with some other major brands and some much higher, much higher quality. Well, okay, it's of good quality, competing with things that of perceived higher quality. So. I recommend this one. It's not necessarily a sipping whiskey, like probably wouldn't pour it over the rocks, but it's absolutely great for mixing cocktails. It's a straight bourbon, so it means it's been aged for two years. At the minimum, it doesn't have any sort of other age statement on it. So like I said, it's not particularly expensive, but it gets the job done, it's pretty darn good. So next, I'm going to be adding my bitters, my Angostura bitters. I'm adding three dashes. That's what I like to call for between two and three is a standard. So to dash it in, flip it over, one, two, three. I thought that was pretty heavy, but it's probably closer to four because you get a little bit of leakage when you first flip it over. Genuinely don't know if that varies bottle to bottle, how much leaks out the top, but just keep that in mind. Um, if you don't want it as bitter heavy, to count that first couple dribbles as a dash. So now you've got your three liquid ingredients in the mix. Now you're just going to stir it down. So stir between 45 seconds to a minute. What you're doing is you're chilling it down to get it to almost a syrupy consistency. So that's important because even though you're serving it on ice, you're not going to be serving it on this ice. You are traditionally serving it on that big block that you want it to look really pretty. So you want it to be cold going into the glass. So probably not going to stir it for the length I literally just recommended for the sake of the video and not boring you watching me spin this around 80-90 times for no good. But next I'll show you how I'm gonna peel that orange. A lot of people would do that in advance, including me for anything other than the sake of the video. I like to get my peels prepped in advance if I know I'm gonna be making multiple of these. Um, they keep for a little bit. If you just leave them out, they're gonna dry up real quick. So what I do sometimes is I'll take a Ziploc bag, put a little wet paper towel in there, or damp paper towel and then put your peels in and that'll keep them good for at least the at least the evening maybe into the next day i wouldn't really push it too much longer than that so that's the next thing i'm going to do we're going to talk about how to peel this orange all right so what i'm going to be doing is taking a swath off of this orange so if you're serving this to somebody who's going to be particular about it or if you really just want to impress go ahead and look around the orange and try and avoid some of the rough spots see like right here there's a bit of a scar, same with down here. So right about here I see a nice swath that we can cut. So there's two ways of doing it. You can either cut down from the tip to the stem or you can cut all the way around. 
So if you cut all the way around, you get a much longer swath. It also is naturally twisted, which looks pretty cool. It uses a lot more orange. You can only get a couple off like that. It's also honestly a little tricky. The best way to do that would be to use something like a potato peeler or a vegetable peeler, whereas in this case, I'm gonna be using this little knife. So no need to get overly dramatic if you don't need to, but if you want to, go <laughs> right ahead for it. So I'm just going to be cutting down. It's not the sharpest knife in the world, so probably use a good sharpen. But I'm just cutting down all the way down. So that's a pretty good peel there. So if you'll notice, it's got all this white stuff on it still. That is officially called the pith, and that's probably what you know whenever you bit into an orange wedge or whatever. That's the bitter stuff. So I think a lot of people often associate um, lemon or orange zest with being bitter. That's not necessarily the case. That's just when you bit into the rind, you got this part. So we also don't want this leaching into our drink. So what we're gonna do is remove the pith. So if you see down here, this is pretty good. You can kind of see the pores of the orange or of the skin itself. So I'm not gonna worry about too much down here. The other thing you don't wanna do is you don't wanna mash this into the cutting board because then you're gonna squeeze out the oils that you want in your drink. So I'm just gonna light as lightly as I can, hold on on this end, get that knife down low and just pull up this pith all the way down to the end. I think the thing is most reminiscent to would be like flaying or skinning a fish. <laughs> that's not the graphic you want, then forget I said that. All right, so you can see a lot more of these pores and I don't see much oil left on the board. This is just water from where I cleaned the board. So from here, plop this right in your drink. Honestly, that's all you need to do for the sake of today and because I am way more extra than I need to be, I'm gonna go ahead and trim it up. So just remove the rough edges I also use proper knife etiquette. My fingertips are a little exposed right now. I really should be tucking them in a little more. I'm gonna be going in. Let's go like this. This is just whatever you want it to be. You can pull up other YouTube videos. I might even do one on my own of all different ways to cut garnishes. This is just one way. I like to do it like this because you can also take these like kind of, it kind of reminds me of a tie or something. You can pierce each end of this with a cocktail pick and then curl it around and put some sort of berry or something in the middle or another fruit or pass a straw through it. So that'll work. And now I'll pan back out so you can see how I actually plop this into the drink. So now we've got our garnish cut. We've got our drink mix. Like I said, probably want to do the garnish in advance because while we've been doing this, the drink gets a little diluted. Now granted, typically when you serve a drink like this over ice, the point is that it gets diluted over time, but people expect that to happen while it's in their hand, not while it's in your glass. So generally speaking, as soon as you make, as soon as you make a drink, try and serve it then. But if you haven't waited too long, it's still gonna taste delicious. So garnish, drink, glass. So Properly, you'd probably serve this in an old-fashioned glass. That's one of those things where <laughs> the drink's old enough that the glass is named after it. And also, they're really just made for one another. It helps you get the orange aroma. It also just makes it look fancy. This is probably officially what would be like a double rocks glass, arguably like a triple rocks glass. This thing's pretty darn big for what we're using, but those are very reminiscent of an old-fashioned glass, so it will work for the purposes of today. I will or have a video on glasses on the channel, so I'll explain a bit more of the difference there. I'll also talk about the fact that you can really interchange them. It suits your purpose and how you want to display your drink. So, like I said, it's served on ice. Also, like I said, typically you would use big old cubes or one big cube. I don't have that luxury today, so I'm just going to be putting a couple of chunks in there because it's already cooled. I'm going to grab my julep strainer, which is made for mixing glasses, especially, and stick it in there like that. 
And I'm gonna pour this out and see if you can kind of tell how it's gotten syrupy. And actually, when I look in there, I can see, it almost looks like when you see heat waves on the water or something, you can tell that it's gotten really viscous. And that's from both the syrup being added and the chilling from the ice. And look at that. So you'll see old fashions a few different colors. Some are that golden color from the bourbon itself. So that's dictated by the bourbon. So if it's a darker bourbon, you get darker old fashioned. If it's a lighter bourbon or any whiskey, like I was saying, like if I poured this crown in there, probably be a little darker. With this brandy, it would really take on the color of the bitters, which are hiding back here. Whereas this was a little bit an even blend. To me, I would probably call that kind of an, an amber. It's got a slightly red hue to it. So, of a strawberry amber. That'll work. All right, so then the last thing you need to do to finish this is zest your orange onto the drink itself. So I'm just gonna grab the garnish, I'm gonna pinch it. And what that does is that ejects all of the zest, it ruptures the pores, and it puts the zest on the top of the water. So you can see it almost looks like a slight film on the top of the water. I don't expect you to see that right now, but if you do this at home, you'll see there's a slight film that gets really like sucked off after the first or two drinks or sips, but you smell that rum. It's just orange. And then if you want to really get the point across, just rub it around the lip of the glass and that gets just a little bit of the zest all the way around the edge. So as you rotate the glass, you'll continue getting that. So now I'm just going to twist this twist the orange, so it's typically served with what's called the twist of orange. So I've got that twisted up. When I let go, it's gonna stay twisted. And just drop it in. Also, the official recipes typically call for a maraschino cherry. So not like, try and avoid like the bright red stuff that you see on like an ice cream sundae. There's much nicer, the brand is called Luxardo, makes maraschino cherries or maraschino, depends on how you pronounce it or even better would be a brandied cherry, which is a cherry that's effectively been, it's not pickled, but it's the same basic process. It's just been set in brandy. So those really bright red ones with all the dye, that color can get in, and that's also just a really tart flavor for this drink. You want it to be a little richer and sweeter. And please, if you can, make sure they're pitted. That is not something you need a guest or let alone a customer, but we're probably talking guests in this case. You don't want them chopping into that. If, they, if they're already chopping their ice or something. So anyway, there you have it. That is the old fashioned. It is my personal recipe slash take on the old fashioned, but it matches up with a lot of what's online and what's in literature. And there you have it. Like I said, it's actually a pretty simple drink. It is delicious. Let me get this on taste. It's strong, it's definitely boozy. It's, like I said, it's majority bourbon. So depending on how much kick you wanna feel in the back of your throat, dial in the proof you're using. This is definitely a drink where you can use a nice whiskey because you are accenting the whiskey at the heart of it. I wouldn't go overboard on that because you are adding quite a bit of sugar. So if you are somebody who likes a drier, like a rye whiskey, this might not be for you just because this is gonna sweeten it up possibly beyond what you want. Likewise, with the Crown, that's already a very sweet whiskey or something like um, like Old Camp Peach Pecan Whiskey. Those are very sweet. That makes for a very good sort of dessert drink. But for whiskey enthusiasts, if you are one or you're serving for one, they might not care for that. But just play around with it because it is a really simple drink. It's arguably cheap. Um, once you have the bitters, these are like eight bucks and they last for like genuinely years. Unless you are making a ton of these drinks, this is gonna last you a long time. The sugar, I highly recommend you make at home. Don't bother paying the eight bucks a bottle or whatever in the store to buy sugar water. That's really all it is. Or if you wanna go the more traditional route, use the sugar cube, dash the Angostura bitters on top of it, add about a teaspoon of water or sparkling water, mix it up, dissolve the sugar, and then build in your bourbon. So. That is the old fashioned. This is like granddaddy of cocktails and it's fantastic.
This is the Home Bar Beginner, I'm Vic Vinegar, and stay tuned for the next video.